sorry. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Laura Walker. I'm the president of New York Public Radio. And I'm really pleased uh, to host this event with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, it's great to see so many friends around. Uh, I, I want to particularly thank the Green Foundation, who's here, who, whose generous gift supports this great space. Um, our friends from the Ford Foundation, the Tao Foundation, Rockefeller Brothers, Amex, and of course, our great friends from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, I also want to uh, welcome and thank many of the members of our community advisory board who are here, including uh, the new chair, Barbara Girali Matos. Um, Barbara, there you are. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so many years ago, or about about ten years ago, almost, we created this space uh, to be a destination for civic engagement and collaboration among New Yorkers, a place where we could bring the kind of conversations that we have on air into a more intimate space. That is, as my um, teenage daughter says, IRL in real life. <laughs> but you know, kind of paradoxically. This event, like many events now here, are in turn being seen on Facebook Live. So I want to welcome those of you who are joining us on Facebook. Um, tonight, we are bringing together some extraordinarily talented cultural critics and thinkers for what I know will be a powerful conversation to explore how their writings and their perspectives about art and culture are rooted in identity, racial justice, and social equity. This is particularly important today for obviously a few reasons. Arts and cultural criticism are too often viewed through a white lens. In fact, the impetus for tonight's event actually came out of some conversations I was having with Tom and others at the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs uh, about the lack of diversity among cultural <laughs> critics. Um, it's particularly important today as we face also what is a startling reduction uh, in journalism about New York. You see uh, the New York Times used to be uh, publishing all sorts of you know, uh, reviews and other things. There's, it's really shrinking, and it's shrinking in all of the, the newspapers. That's true of journalism as a whole. And <clears throat> so we at New York Public Radio are trying to figure out what do we, what do, we do about that and working with all of you. Um, and we, and, and, but also today, we live in a world in which old forms of racism have been given new energy and license, and, as also, in, and also in which other more subtle but no le less vexing forms of racism are finally being openly and forthrightly discussed in mainstream media. So it's a really interesting time, and we believe it's imperative that we talk about and understand many different perspectives. Um, we live here in New York in one of the most diverse cities in the world. I had actually, uh, it said one of the most diverse city in the world, and I looked it up and apparently Toronto is the most diverse city in the world according to the BBC last week, but who knows. Um, <laughs> regardless, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to bring people together and to know each other better. And we can only make pro progress if we talk and if we listen as well. Um, I keep in mind a quote from Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. If you get close to things that are painful and difficult and unequal, it will hurt you. It will make you uncomfortable. But in discomfort, I want to tell you there is power. And I believe that. Um, and our belief is that conversation leads to or can lead to empathy, understanding, and action. And that is part of what we are really committed to here at New York Public Radio as we strive to add more voices to our air on the radio and our podcasts, um, because it is in the diversity of opinion and in forums like these that we can provide listeners with deeper analysis, more authentic perspectives, and real insight. So I am so pleased that you will uh, get to see uh, Rebecca Carroll, our own Rebecca Carroll, moderating today's event. She is our special editor for projects. She joined us about two years ago for a project that we called The Year of Talking Honestly, which was funded by the Mellon Foundation and the Ford Foundation. Rebecca then went on to work on the award-winning podcast, There Goes the Neighborhood. Tonight's conversation builds on her extraordinary interview series, How I Got Over and Dear President, What You Need to Know About Race a collection of essays by African-American writers. That series just won a National Association of Black Journalists Salute to Excellence Award last month. So, yes. <laughs> Dear President, what do you need to know about race? Um, 
Later this fall, we will pilot a podcast series that Rebecca conceived based on W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. So please keep an eye out, an ear out for the performances. They'll be here and they'll also be podcast. Um, and now it is my great honor to introduce one of our board members at New York Public Radio, Tom Finkelpearl, who's the commissioner of New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And he has been a great uh, advocate of all of the arts here in New York and a great supporter of New York Public Radio and is Im implementing Create New York City, an ambitious cultural plan that really is about expanding inclusiveness and diversity. And as you know, Tom is also a great human being. So I am delighted to have him here today. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. This is too high. Um, so I'll try to be rather brief. Um, we did launch a diversity uh, survey several years back, and we got some interesting results. And I do want to say quite clearly the results we did not get. We did not get good results in terms of uh, getting good numbers about disability uh, inclusion in New York City. And that there's a complicated reasons for that, but that's something we've been working on absolutely since that time. And so when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are absolutely uh, including um, disability in that list. Um, so we, when we did look at the numbers, what we found was that the uh, cultural sector of New York City is overwhelmingly white, especially in management positions, uh, that the least um, diverse job in the entire cultural sector is curators, that the people who you know, think of what's on the walls uh, and make those decisions are not a diverse group of people. Now, when we were thinking about that, we were thinking, well, I don't know where journalism fits into that continuum. And I remember some folks coming into the office and saying, you know, this is actually probably, I don't know if it says dire as curators, but it's pretty dire. So we thought it would be great. And this is where we had started some discussions. We said, wouldn't it be great to get uh, some folks together and get some folks on stage that could, could address those issues a little bit. So we uh, rolled out the cultural plan. We had 418 public meetings. We had a very interesting sort of encounter with New York City last year. I was at least at, at 100 of those meetings, and we got to meet New Yorkers. And when the um, plan rolled out, the thing we did highlight uh, on that day, and there's 94 recommendations. I recommend that everybody in this room read the entire 150-page <laughs> document. It's really interesting. Um, but diversity, equity, and inclusion was the headline. Uh, that we said we are going to start to include uh, questions on all grant applications about how people address diversity, equity, and inclusion, that we are going to require members of the cultural institution group next year uh, to adopt diversity, equity, and inclusion plans. So that is a, a, you know, a good preface lately for the panel we have today. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Mertz Gilmar, Leah Krauss is here. Thank you for some funding for this. I think one of the things we decided is we have to pay people to sit on stages like this, right? Right? So we are, they're getting, these people are getting paid a little bit of money. <laughs> artists, artists need to get paid. Uh, we need to keep artists in New York City. They need to be places to live. They need to be places to work. So with that, uh, I also just want to shout out to some of our staff. I know Dia Vidge was very uh, instrumental in this. There's some of our staff members here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to sit down and uh, listen to this fantastic group of people. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Can you hear me? Is this on? Doesn't feel like it's on. Oh, there we go. There we go. So I am here with my esteemed panel, Alex E. Jung from New York Magazine, Faria Roisin. Who <laughs> is uh, critic at large of, of various places and Antoine Sargent, one of my very favorite actual critics of art. Um, so we we're here. Let's. I'm going to start actually by saying, woo! Who watched the Emmys? Um, <laughs> we saw a glorious sweep of wins last night for people of color. We saw. Lena Waithe become the first black woman to win for comedy writing. We saw Riz Ahmed become first South Asian man to win uh, for acting. Donald Gross. Glover became first black man to win for directing a comedy series. And Sterling K. Brown 
became the first black man to win for outstanding lead actor in a drama series. What are we hearing here? First, 2017, y'all. 2017. <laughs> the wins were glorious. They were. Um, and But they're happening in a very certain and specific framework, right? Dave Chappelle, who gave Donald Glover uh, his award, said when he got on stage, I honestly can't believe how many black people there are here. <laughs> and most of us <laughs> do that. Most of us folks of color do that when we really are in any space, uh, uh, specifically media spaces. Um, we're, and we're generally surprised when we see uh, more than one of us. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about the necessity of diversifying racial and ethnic representation in various mainstream industries. Among them, the field of art and cultural criticism to create more spaces for critics of color. But for those of us who are already in the industry, how do we engage with the assumed obligation that we look at art and culture through the default lens of whiteness? James Baldwin, himself a brilliant cultural critic, wrote about this idea of whiteness often, notably in The Fire Next Time. The American Negro has the great advantage of having never believed the collection of myths to which white Americans cling, that their ancestors were all freedom-loving heroes, that they were born in the greatest country the world has ever seen, or that Americans are invincible in battle and wise in peace, that Americans have always dealt honorably with Mexicans and Indians and all other neighbors or inferiors, that American men are the world's most direct and virile, that American women are pure. Negroes know far more about white Americans than that. It can almost be said, in fact, that they know about white Americans what parents, or anyway mothers, know about their children, and that they very often regard white Americans that way. And perhaps this attitude held in spite of what they know and have endured helps to explain why Negroes, on the whole, and until lately, this is 1960-something or other, have allowed themselves to feel so little hatred. The tendency has really been, insofar as this was possible, to dismiss white people as the slightly mad victims of their own brainwashing. Mm -hmm. 50 years later, people, 50 years later, it's fairly clear that this self-brainwashing is what has given us Donald Trump. Last week, The Atlantic published a much-discussed piece by ta Coates titled The First White President, in which Coates effectively argues that Trump campaigned and won on an ideology of whiteness and white supremacy. So that's where we are, where we've always been. The spaces we operate in and are canopied by white tent poles. The spaces we observe, comment upon, and perhaps more importantly, and what gathers us here tonight, engage with on a critical level. Antoine, I want to start with you. You wrote a piece earlier this year in Artsy unpacking the response to the controversial uh, painting of Emmett Till in an open casket at the Whitney by white artist Dana Schultz, who said in a statement following the controversy, I don't know what it is like to be black in America, but I know what it is like to be a mother. Emmett was Mamie Till's only son. The thought of anything happening to your child is beyond comprehension. She said, I don't know what it feels like to be black in America, but then she went ahead and she made a piece of art that was about blackness and pain. Can you imagine, as an art critic, Antoine, saying, I don't know what it's like to be white in America, but I know what it's like to do whatever, whatever, so let me just go ahead and write this critique of that one aspect because it works for me. Why or why not? I mean... <laughs> The, I mean, that kind of situation, first I found, I found that to be kind of disingenuous, right? Because you can kind of, she just stops short, right? Um, and then kind of investigate her own kind of whiteness, right? And so that particular situation can only happen to a black mother in this country, right? And so there's no other um, way to get around it, right? And so I think with that piece, what I was trying to kind of, um, 
negotiate was why is blackness always assumed um, as an instrument of protest, right? And so what was interesting to me about um, her artistic gesture was that she was trying to show some sort of solidarity, right? Um, as twisted as you know it may have been or whatever, she was trying to say that I'm tired of racism, et cetera, right? That you was, really, you feel yeah, that it I was think, about racism for her? Yeah, I think that like, because if you look at the history of the black body in art, we often assume that position. We are the, that's how you express, or even just outside of art, like that's how you express like, like the black body has come to mean, has come to be the symbol of like injustice or fighting injustice, all that stuff. So yeah, I absolutely think that she felt like she was showing solidarity. I don't think that, I guess I'm not just, as, I guess I'm not as cynical um, <laughs> about um, her intentions. I think she was in fact trying to, um, like show that she was kind of down, you know, but really? the, yeah, I think so. so but I think that, so no, but I, I think, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, just, I think yeah, she was showing I, down, right? Yeah, like, but I, th around Emmett Till, right? I'm going to be down around. Yeah, Emmett but Till? also that's not, she's not the first white artist or artist in general to use his body. Right. And For so sure. like, so I think that like, there was also kind of a history of, you know, like visual culture that she was also kind of uh, responding to, right? Um, and the way that we've used his body and called upon his body. So I, I guess like my, I thought that was pretty clear in a piece, but. Um, no, you like are, I, I read the piece. I'm just saying for the, for the mm -hmm. folks who are here who may not have read yeah. the piece. I mean, I, I found it a really interesting, thoughtful um, examination of it, but, yeah. I, but I, I, I didn't get that the, the, she was the down part of it. Yeah, um, I think that you know, like she, or at least my, at least how I kind of took the work was to be that this is about this is very much about me aligning myself with um, this particular um, civil rights movement in this country. But I think that the the part, the other part of it was that or I think that really kind of um, got on people's nerves was the fact that she didn't do all the work, right? And often we don't do all the work, I feel like, um, around black representation in art um, or even in culture, right? And I think that like the way in which we were limitedly kind of defined and shown and you know the, the characters we play um, and the way that we paint ourselves all kind of informed, um, you know, Dana Schultz saying, I can use this image because this is an American image, right? Um, you're looking at me like I'm crazy. But I'm not looking at you like you're crazy. What, what I'm interested in sort of going a little bit deeper on is what is an American image yeah. and how an American image is actually synonymous with a white image or, or a white lens or, mm -hmm. okay, this is, I have permission to use this image because I see it through a white lens. Yeah, I mean, I like... I think that the Emma Tillman image, at least in the way that like I'm thinking of American imagery, meaning that like this is an image that we saw in our history books. This is an image. This is a, someone we learn about. Like this is kind of a story that we know, right? Um, that lives on in kind of the American lexicon. And so I, I kind of feel like that's an like he's an American. Yes, he's a black image, but he's also an American image. And I don't necessarily like draw like black people are American. And so, like the the image for me is an American image, and but so. But it's not to her, right? Yeah, but, I mean, but, that's the whole thing. But what thing makes is, that not an American image well, to her because she's this white? Is, this is the point of very much the point of this conversation, right? Is that Black history is American history, right? Right. But I think that there are so many white Americans who don't include Black history as part of their history. Oh, absolutely. Right. So seeing the picture of Emmett Till was sort of like, oh, OK, I know that people have talked about this. I don't need permission or or any kind of <clears throat> I don't know. I don't need to revisit or or check with myself. I can just I'm free to use it. Yeah. yeah but you, you, you don't think she was free to use the image? I don't. I don't. Well, well, but I want to include okay, these guys, sorry, right? Sorry. Right, right? <laughs> sorry. So so we'll talk about just, this for the next terms, hour and a half. Just in terms of, of, know, of <laughs> <laughs> establishing sort of whiteness as a thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a thing it, 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 or not a thing. I mean, it's a thing that isn't really a thing. Um, <laughs> uh, how does that um, 
the, the transparency of whiteness affect the way that you approach your work and writing both to you and Faria and Alex? You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting, especially uh, when you're doing uh, any sort of essay writing or whatever on the internet um, or for print publications, uh, the way in which uh, I at least am careful about the language that I use um, in order to <laughs> Uh, say what I say. Sometimes uh, that's, I feel like we're, to backtrack, I guess, I feel like we're still in a very early stage, sometimes in pop culture criticism, at least, of naming For sure. uh, white people. For sure. Of For even sure. Say me, saying the word white people. For sure. I feel like when you say it, uh, whether it's on Twitter or uh, even in a conversation, white people will feel... I, th I feel like away. they get a little tense. They'll feel away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they're because they're being named, which yeah, I think right. uh, they're used to yeah. doing to other people right. all the time, yeah. and suddenly they're now being named by us. I know. Which is really uh, an interesting thing to participate in, um, and sometimes I do it with jokes. Um, I think for me, at least, humor has been an interesting or like effective vehicle to do that. So like you know, like Big Little Eyes. Everyone loves Big Little Eyes. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe not everyone. <laughs> I liked it. I did. I like it a lot. It's, you know, it's super white. It's, I, it, super listen, right, here's right, the thing. Right. This is the conversation. This is exactly the conversation, which is that I, I do enjoy the show. It's great writing. It's great right. directing. It's great acting. The only person of color is Zoe. Right. Ridiculously beautiful, like, light. Right. Come on. I mean, she's like... Might as well be. But the, the whole, the, I don't know. The but little lies, they liked rem reminding you that she was like the beautiful one. Right. Exactly. And, I feel and like the that sexual was like, one. Yeah, exactly. Bit, right? So the, yeah. it was almost as if they were, like it felt so white to do that, to, to totally remind us. Totally white to do that. So this is, this, is, this is what I want to get at, right? So right. how are we approaching our work now that that is something that we can say. Right. Mm. So a, like a jokey post that I did was just, um, who's the saddest, whitest, <laughs> uh, richest woman on Big Little Eyes? And for me, that was like a funny way of kind of redirecting. Reese, right? Right. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Reese, well, actually, totally. actually oh, wait, I no? thought it was Nicole because she was the saddest. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, fair, 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 fair. Okay. Saddest. I had a three-pronged rubric for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, that works. But I, I guess like part of it is is about sort of how you sort of redirect the lens onto how whiteness is constructed in these narratives. And I think with Big Little Lies, the interesting thing about it is the fact that I think it could you could have a show that is cast of all white people or cast with all white people that is conscious and thinking about whiteness. Mm. Um, I think that that often doesn't happen because it's made by you, white people. Can you creators. think of an example? Well, so I think inadvertently it happens. So I think when you read the text as opposed to thinking about the creators and what their intentions were, mm -hmm. I think sometimes you can have an interesting um, discourse come out of it. So like for me, I think Girls is an interesting example of this, both in how it succeeds and fails. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first season of Girls is really interesting because to me, I'm like, oh yeah, I went to school with those girls like all the time. And to me, it's, it's actually a, a display and manifestation of a certain kind of whiteness that I think is really fascinating to deconstruct. I think that the problem is that I'm not sure how aware um, necessarily they were about that. And I think the conversation slipped into what I think is a kind of more basic one about representation um, and including people and having cast members of color as opposed to thinking how is this show in some ways about white supremacy. Absolutely, and are we not the ones who call that right. out? Right, oh yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I mean that and is so our job, I think. That's what, a job you're saying? Right, that, that would be one of uh, my job maybe that I would think. As, a, as a critic as a critic yes, you would say yeah, yeah. Faria do you agree oh yeah absolutely I mean my friend Ziba Blay and I uh, started a podcast in 2012 yes. Ziba's here yes, yes. Ziba in 2012 there were podcasts in 2012 yeah. um, and it was I mean I could be wrong but I believe it was the first podcast to talk about race within uh, uh, and pop culture mm -hmm and the intersectionalities of like um, queerness and transness and, and, and you know, we, we started it because it was a response to girls 
the first season of Girls came out in 2012, May. And both Zeba and I were like, what the... F-? Yeah, like, we all remember know, the was, actual date. Yeah. The brown girls remember the day and the month <laughs> and then whatnot. Yeah. And it was so shocking to me because, you know, we're both writers living in New York City and we were not being represented in this TV show called Girls. And it was so upsetting to me and, and to Ziba. And so we started having this dialogue and it and it turned out to be like super cathartic and helpful for the both of us to understand where we stood um, within the realm of, of writing and whiteness. And, you know, of course, like so many of our editors, fellow writers were white, especially during that time. And it was very difficult navigating how to how to talk about the elephant in the room. But I think we developed a language which I feel now we're so open with, like, you know, calling out white people or just saying white people, you know, and, and, and I think Rebecca, you mentioned like, you know, it's very new that we, we've started doing this, but it's less new for us to call them out as it is for them to hear it. Mm-hmm. But I th- mm-hmm. that, but also like for us to do it in public platforms right. like Twitter, mm-hmm. you know, which I think has become such a vital, um, tool for us to to call white people out, you know. And I think um, for me, whiteness. I get a lot from whiteness because it's 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 my main character and so much of what I write. And um, ironically, <laughs> um, and you know, but I think it's it's been really really important to sort of um, deconstruct whiteness. And it's been actually a really beautiful journey to see how like since 2012 and. 12 to 2017 in the last five years we now have the vernacular to call this stuff out i was gonna swear but i don't know if i'm allowed to but you what (laughs) am i allowed to swear of course yeah totally i mean we'll have to (laughs) lot of that probably but in any of (laughs) no i think that 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 idea and that notion of identifying and calling out like i mean black and brown folks have always done this calling out thing Um, But around whiteness, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. James Baldwin, Claudine Rankine, I mean, all sorts of folks have written about it. But now we're in a space where a lot of white folks are hearing it Mm. and are kind of trying to figure out what that um, means and and how that uh, assists or is adjacent to what work they do. Antoine, you know, you write a ton about um, uh, classical, art, you know, not classical art, but you know, uh, fine art and contemporary art. Um, uh, Alex and Faria and I write a lot about um, film and books and and television. But when you go to an exhibit, um, do you find that you are looking at this work in a way that you need to then process in your piece that is palatable? to white readership? I mean, in a word, no. <laughs> um, but I, I think I always like approached a kind of art criticism or looking at art or um, being in a museum from my perspective. And so that's, you know, black gay male. Um, and I'm always just delivering that perspective. I think if you look at um, the history or you look at art criticism today, you know, that what is left, um, what you have is a lot of, you know, basically white people um, just telling you how they feel about, you know, rightly or wrongly in context without con- whatever, you know, about the art on the wall, right? And mostly um, art that excludes us, right? And so um, I think the, the, in writing, it's kind of, I mostly write about kind of um, POC kind of artist as a choice, you know, kind of um, because those artists are just not um, kind of heavily or widely discussed or not w- discussed um, on the page by writers like us, you know? And so I think that when I'm kind of reviewing a show or I'm, you know, writing a feature, it's always about kind of getting out a perspective that is not the one that you read in the Times, the one that you kind of le- read in kind of these, um, in most art publications. And do you anticipate, do you anticipate a white readership in any capacity? No, not really. I mean, I don't, I, I, no, I mean, mostly kind of the readership is probably mostly white if, you know, just kind of, if you're being real. Um, 
but it's not like I'm trying to explain the culture to them or I'm trying to kind of um, like make it easier for them to understand. It's like, this is a level, catch up, you know, because like right. when you read, you know, kind of other criticism, they're not doing that work for, you know, us. And I think that there's also kind of this thing where, where um, white critics use kind of art history um, and everything's kind of in relation to our art history, right? So that's kind of like the, the, the typical format you kind of find a review. It's a reference to old dead white dude, right? And so not saying that's not important because visual culture kind of is, you know, kind of built on different kind of touchstones in kind of culture, but that's not the only way to look at art. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, and then there are other artists kind of, you know, that have also, we're also working in those ways um, of color who had been erased from the story. And so I think often I'm trying to do the work of like, how does this relate to another black artist, right? Mm -hmm. Or how does mm -hmm. this relate mm -hmm. to um, a woman of color? Or how does this relate to mm -hmm. kind of um, someone who's in the culture working that way um, that had been overlooked? Mm -hmm. And so it's always mm -hmm. kind of, it's less about, I mean, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about white people in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm always thinking about people of color, I'm always thinking about, was there some, you know, kind of artistic production within the community that led to this artist making a breakthrough? Because often when you speak to kind of artists of color, they're always referencing each other and they're mm -hmm. always kind of having these conversations mm -hmm. that we never or almost never see um, in mainstream magazines or mainstream newspapers mm -hmm. or um, on people, you know, blogs or whatever. And so I think a lot of the work is about kind of like making sure that the artist's voice is heard. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of, you know, Alex, you wrote a piece um, about Bon Joon Ho's um, film Okja. Okja, Okja yeah. yeah. Um, in which you pointed out a, a sort of a flagrant mistranslation. Um, uh, you wrote, but one that. But pur purposeful. Right, yeah. which I thought was really interesting, yeah. but one that would only be apparent to those who speak both languages, Korean and English. Moreover, the mistranslation is a clever subversion of the supremacy of English. Can you talk a little bit about, mm. about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, that sort of harkens back to my days when I lived in Seoul, um, and I uh, taught SATs, as many exp an expat does in Seoul. Um, <laughs> and... You know, and when, when you're in Korea, it's just a, it's an imperative to speak English, to learn English, to become fluent in it so that you can become a, a more mobile body in this world, mm -hmm. right? So that you can get, even get a job in Korea. To even advance in Korea, you have to know English. You have to be fluent in it. And so steeped, I, I, so I just know that when Bong Joon-ho makes a movie, that's his world that he's coming out of. So the jokes around translation and the jokes around... Um, uh, Korean, how Korean language operates in the film, um, are are all coming from that place, that pressure of needing to know English, needing to speak it, mm -hmm. and so that's what I that's what I liked about the joke was that, you know, it's a joke that you only understand if you speak both Korean and English. Uh, otherwise, you just read the subtitle and you just assume that the subtitle is correct, right? You give um, authority to that subtitle mm -hmm. very readily. We all do. Um, and that's that's interesting how when you hear it when when you speak Korean and you watch it and you hear that just flagrant mistranslation it's uh, hilarious. Is it really? Because like yeah. to me it gave me anxiety. Like I, I just felt like it's not the right it's not the right thing. It's not what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and, and I guess uh, I I mean he wrote it for like I talked to Stephen Yun too. He who does yes. he was part of that joke. Yeah, and he uh, is one of the stars in the movie, and he talked about how he was like, yeah, it was a joke that was made just for us. <laughs> like, how crazy is that? Like, how crazy is that that someone made a Korean-American joke mm. in a, like, a huge feature film that you would it. only get if you spoke those languages? I love it. And that, that it. felt sort of special because it feels private. Mm. I love that. And but then we explain it to everyone, so now everyone knows. <laughs> everyone knows. <laughs> right, exactly. All our secrets. And I, I think it's, it's, I mean, obviously I'm not Korean, but I, I think that it's, as Asians, we don't have a lot of access to those secrets. You know, our communities are so much more isolated. And so I, I, I have heard that before, obviously. And so, like, I read your piece. And so <laughs> um, I just thought it was, like, really beautiful that there was something 
that was just yours, right. you know? Yeah. It's so interesting, the whole thing of something being just ours or yours or the way in which that becomes suddenly subject to, you know, you're being divisive, you're self-segregating, you're doing this and you're doing that. I mean, I think we are in a space and in a time where um, the, the even those words and that terminology of self-segregation, I'd like to take, you know, into account and question, you know, there is agency and choice in being just with us, mm. just with ourselves, right? It's not, you know, segregation is a term that comes out of a, a antebellum, you know, South. It's, it's not a, a, a word or that we that we came up with. Um, I wanted to ask you, Freya, uh, about your really excellent piece in Teen Vogue last week um, about the white savior complex in American films. Um, among the films you mentioned was Lion, about an Indian boy adopted by white Australian parents. Um, it struck a nerve for me. I, I mean, I've seen it um, because I was adopted uh, into a white family, and uh, so it resonated on uh, numerous different levels. But you were apprehensive about seeing the film because you thought the role of his adoptive mother, played by Nicole Kidman, would eclipse <laughs> that of the boy. Of course. Shocking. <laughs> it did. <laughs> uh, and wrote, she's also she, an adoptive, adopted mother. Well, adopted that's mother. complicated, yeah. right? Because it's the Scientology mm. situation, and so she's now well, no longer able to talk about these children. and. She can't. Damn. Right, yeah. No, I mean, it was a big thing last night at the Emmys when she thanked she her. I saw your yeah. tweets. Yeah, yeah, you saw them. Yeah. <laughs> I saw your tweets. Um, but she wrote, uh, she was ever present, her whiteness, all seeing, all knowing, omnipresent. Um, how does this through line of whiteness, the centering of whiteness, even as we acknowledge this whiteness, uh, change from genre to genre? Is it different when we write about it in a film? Is it different when we look, about, look at it uh, through art? Um, uh, TV, Bria. Hmm, that's a very good question. I don't know if I have the answer to it though. I mean, I I write predominantly about film and television, and I mean, I, if we're talking about white supremacy, which is ubiquitous, then yes, it's the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about a construct, um, and I think that something that was really powerful about the Emmys last night was that, you know, people won because they were good at what they were doing. Like, nobody saw the Thanksgiving ep Like, we've not, never seen the, epi the Thanksgiving episode that Lena Waithe wrote for Master of None ever before on television. The, nothing like that exists. That's why she won. And I think that people, when they, when they talk about... Um, diversity and they're like oh my god so many people of color won they forget that they deserved it mm, you know mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. we we almost we talk about it as if it's like oh we're, we're all like finally figuring it out it's like nah like these people actually worked so hard at what they do you know like when I watched Riz Ahmed in Night Of like it was so so troubling it was a really really hard film um uh, sorry TV show to watch um because I'm Muslim and, and I think he deserved like this. It's like you don't hear or see the depictions of Muslims on television. Like we forget that. Um, and to portray somebody so complex and, and muddied um, by the justice system, um, especially within the context of being a brown Muslim man, um, yeah, that's why he won. I mean, Donald Glover won because Atlanta was the best TV show last year. You know, like, so I think it's really important to reiterate these things. And when we do that, we're, we're, we're reminding white folks that white supremacy is coming to an end. And I really believe that. And so, like... Um, I think it's powerful. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, I, I don't care. I, I think it, <laughs> I think, because I like started and then I was like, this is something I actually, yeah. Want. yeah. Um, you know, and I think that it's important to, and this is why we do what we do. We're, 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 um, we're acknowledging something, we're referencing something, but we're also giving examples. You know, you said like, whenever you write art criticism, you talk about black and brown folks and like that, to me is like what's so exciting about being alive right now and reading the criticism that we are reading right now because it's not like we didn't exist it's not like our work was never there it's always been there it's just that the people that were writing about it weren't centering us that's right 
I, I still so the Emmys is is interesting because you know I'm a TV watcher and this is my gig, um, but. <laughs> I, I get. I sometimes I, I I worry that white supremacy is very flexible too, and that it's able to absorb. <laughs> but it is. But I, I feel as though it's able to absorb a lot, and mm -hmm. and even with the interesting thing about Donald mm. Glover, both times, both of his speeches, I think, were actually great. But I don't know if people saw why they were so great. The first one he won for directing, and he. He mm -hmm. gave a shout out to Hiro Murai, mm -hmm. who is a Japanese American filmmaker who taught him everything, he yeah. learned most of his cinema cinema cinematographic language from. And he gave the mm -hmm. shout out to him because really, like, if we're if we're talking about merit, which these awards are never really about merit, no. Hiro mm -hmm. Murai was yeah. the visual winner of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was the visual mastermind right. behind yep. Atlanta. Right. Atlanta should have won best comedy series. Like uh, this is like getting into like parsing like splitting hairs maybe but to me it was clearly the best comedy ever but he won best actor which i feel like is this tendency for the emmys to choose to single out the individual mm. as the exceptional one totally. aziz ansari won too for acting and i was like he's not that good he's not that good <laughs> yeah. like he's really not he's okay right and if we're talking about acting for atlanta too it's really lakeith stanfield and yeah. brian tyree henry who are amazing right and Zazie, right <laughs> yes Yes. Zazy. And so it's interesting to me the way in which I think like these bodies or these award right. shows are to, are sort of conglomerating around, ooh, sorry, <laughs> around like an individual and saying mm -hmm. this one, this mm -hmm. person is mm -hmm. the best. This person is the exceptional one that we can keep and praise. Mm. And I that sort of feels like still part and parcel of the way in which this organization of bodies right. happens and talent and value. I, I and agree all of with that. you. Yeah, for the, sure. The point about white supremacy being flexible, that really just blew my mind, but it's sorry. Um, I'm not really it's in depth about T V and film, but the one thing that was kind of interesting was when in Hidden Figures, when that whole scene was created around the bathroom. Totally. Like that just didn't happen. Which you know, never like, existed. Yeah. It just never existed. Mm -hmm. And so like there's always it always seems to me that there needs to be a formula and white supremacy in this way, be, you know, in a way that it kind of it comes as right. um, a white savior. Totally. It needs to happen in those type of films. It's it like right. almost and a so part to, of the I art. Mean, so to that end, um, and we're going to open up in a minute to questions, but to that end and sort of why we are here and having this conversation is that we identify that. Mm. We not only identify that, but we live within the framework and confines of that reality. So now that it's a thing, that whiteness is a thing, right. that it's something that we're able to call out, uh, how does that affect the work that we do as critics of art and culture? Right down the line. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I pick and choose. Because I, I'm, I'm also someone who doesn't want to make the same argument over and over again. Fair. And yeah. I also think that I don't want to give too much um, of my space and emotional energy to uh, thinking about whiteness all the time. Yep. Um, even though I'm aware of it and I can sort of talk about it as it in, in forms a work. But, you know, like talking about Okja too, for instance, like a lot of that was really about Korean Americans, Koreans, uh, translation jokes, things like that, that were not, I was not thinking about them, you know? So I think it's important for me to, to do work and to do interviews and reporting with people of color, with the people who are doing work that I think is interesting, that sort of doesn't really have much to do with white people either, because I think we also need to give ourselves space to just grow and breathe and not deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so you, it's a I mix. mean, to it's that end, mix. do you feel like white people need to give us space to breathe? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, and it's about finding institutional spaces where, or not institutional necessarily, but finding spaces where that you're is protected. possible, mm -hmm. yeah. right, where mm -hmm. you're protected. Yeah. Um, I think people also forget that so much labor goes into this kind of work, you know, like so much emotional labor um, and mental labor, like, and it is frustrating that, you know, you become when when you have like enough Twitter followers, people just think you're a thing, you know, that they can just ask questions to <laughs> and that you're just going to do it because you have nothing better to do with your life. Um, and and that's definitely frustrating. But I agree with you, Alex. I think that for me, for the longest time, all I wanted to 
do was write about whiteness because I was so frustrated and I felt so invisible and, and so silenced, especially as like a Muslim queer brown woman. Um, like there's no spaces for me. <laughs> and so I had to really like create my own. And I think Two Brown Girls was a result of that. You know, we both felt so voiceless and so we created something for ourselves. Um, but now I feel encouraged and excited to just write about me or, or what I think irrespective of race. You know, I think it's so frustrating when people from these large organizations, writing publications come to you and they're like, hey, you're brown and Muslim. Do you want to write about this? And you're like, I'm not your token. I'm not your one person that you're never going to hire for anything. I think that's really, uh, not to cut you off, but an important point to, um, to expand upon, which is that you are actually the token. You well, are yeah. actually, right? <laughs> Fortunately, right? yeah. Um, in, in those instances, in yeah, those totally. spaces. And so you either say, I recognize that I am your token mm -hmm. and I'm not going to do that, mm -hmm. Or you know you do it, or you take that money, or you take you, that paper. But 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 it. I think it's really important to say and to recognize when we are the token in those yeah. spaces. It's true. Unfortunately, you know, I think I've become the token many many times, and it's frustrating because I also don't have the privilege to say no a lot of the time because I I I work off my writing. I'm a freelancer, and saying no to a check could cost me my life you know so it is it's such a tricky thing to c constantly navigate that and it's very demoralizing I have to say like I hit a moment of depression every month because of this but it's I have thoughts for you I have thoughts for you we'll talk okay, about okay. it yeah yeah <laughs> um but you know you keep going and 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 I think you know we all um represent something that people need mm -hmm. and not not white folks everybody else and that's why we write that's why we keep writing. <laughs> um, I don't like I, it's I mean, I'm just like trying to wrap my head around kind of what everyone's saying. I don't know. I feel like when I'm writing, I, I really am trying to size up whiteness. And I, I think that like as a strategy, at least for me, it's been to kind of lean into kind of black people, queer people, you know, brown people, you know, kind of the, like their artistic production. Right. Um, in a way that really is about trying to kind of cover it all, right? From the 18-year-old student um, at Parsons to, you know, Candy Wiley or whoever, right? Like trying to kind of make sure that like everyone's voices are being heard because I think that um, at least with blackness, what you end, what end up happening in the art world in particular, it's like there's these voices that kind of rise to the top and then no one else matters, right? And mm -hmm. And then you'll get, you know, kind of the big newspapers and magazines just to write about those folks. And they'll write about those folks no matter mm -hmm. what they're doing, even if it's bad. Um, mm -hmm. But then no one else gets any kind of play, right? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. um, And so I think part of my, um, like, writing and process is really around making sure that, you know, like, I'm being critic, cheerleader, <laughs> um, you know, reporter or whatever to make sure that the ideas kind of get out there because for mm -hmm. far too long um, only certain types of ideas around blackness have been allowed mm -hmm. um, into the mainstream mm -hmm. um, and so like for me I think it's always that it's always trying to do that always trying to make sure that you know um, I'm recognizing that we've already talked about this certain thing so many times and there's so many people that have done this. How about we go and talk about this thing, you know? And then also just kind of um, expanding kind of our ideas around, you know, blackness, um, just not kind of in America, but also kind of, you, you know, I was just in South Africa um, and just trying to kind of really kind of get a global perspective, right? What else is out there? Mm. Um, yeah, and so yeah, it's always kind of like that balancing act in a sense mm -hmm. where it's like I'm always like have ten deadlines because I'm trying to like hit them all, you know, and mm -hmm. not just because um, there's I don't know I always feel like there's a formula to like 
doing this, right? There's like, you know, you go and you are writing, right? It's like you go and you write about the big name writers and then like, or the big name artists, and then you become, you know, a big name writer. And then, you know, you're associated with whatever. And then they ask you to be, you know, to write for catalogs and do all of that stuff. But I, I, I don't know if that's why I've ever started writing. I think it was really more about like the artistic voice and like trying to make sure that, um, the ideas were being worked out, right? And, and and really giving those ideas, you know, kind of, you know, really considering what people were doing, right? And I think that even with someone like Dana Schultz, when you when she took, you know, kind of the black body as a subject, um, for me, what was important was not so much that, it was the why. Why did she do that, right? What was it about, what gave her the kind of you know permission to do that to take Did, on the and body you, and you really needed to pause to think yeah like it was for me at least i was just like what is it about because i don't know like I, I i really do think that there are things like in there's there are way right this is like we've all lived under white supremacy like there's ways in which that we like operate within it to get over and there's and that are not necessarily mm. beneficial to the culture or to the community or whatever. And so, like, I really do think, particularly with, with blackness in a way that blackness has been commercialized, in a way that all types of blackness, from, you know, the YouTube videos we watch of, you know, black men and women and children being shot and, and you know, and like to all of, like, how all of that has become entertainment, um, I really do kind of struggle or and think about kind of the black image that way. It's mm -hmm. not just, mm -hmm. for me at least, it's not just like, white woman did this, she must be, you know, bad. It's like, why did she do that? Well, it's what not. What was the it's reasoning? Not that she's but bad, or not, you know. But like, you know. I mean, in the the way that the the way that the culture kind of reacted to it was like without nuance. And I think that like often we don't give, you know. It's like it's not like she like because well, I was kind of really interested in the fact that like she wasn't the only person who had done that. So why her? Right? Why? And, and and that's always so interesting, at least for me and like the culture is like there. It's like this should have been done like three thousand like times. I can tell you three thousand white artists who's used Emmett Till's face. Yes, but you also recognize that we were in a time and a space and a moment where people were responding to it. And so yes, we yeah. can say no, I'm not, of course I'm this has happened a million times, yeah. but we are keepers of the zeitgeist. You know, we right. are people who look at and stay on the zeitgeist and comment upon the zeitgeist. And so in that moment, <clears throat> you know, when I responded to it, you know, I felt like this is an absolute, um, you know, you're taking a liberty that's just not yours to take. Right. Um, and it was very clear to me in with her statement and when I saw the painting and all the rest. And I think that there's a lot of, um, opportunity to go on about yeah. why or who or in, yeah. and the historical factor of it, but our jobs as as cultural critics and commenters are to sort of look at the zeitgeist and why we're being asked to comment on something in that moment, right? Right. And so, if we want to do it in a more extensive way, sure, you can do it in a long form and something else. But that particular painting and the way that she spoke out to it, what her statement was, and the way that people responded to it, I felt like it demanded something of us. We needed to say something. And to me, it was very clear that she had taken a liberty that was not okay with a lot of black folks. I mean, I can like say, yes, I agree with that, but I also don't think that those, I'm, but I guess my point was those liberties are taken in different ways. All the time. All the damn time. All the time. But this is what I'm so saying. I guess for me, that was the, the problem. The, for me, I guess, was the problem was like, like, okay, yes, I understand. Like, this became like, a, it was on The View, and it was all that, and it became like kind of this pop culture moment in Touchstone. Wait, on The View, did you say? It was on The View. Oh, my God. I and so it was like that. all this thing. But I'm just like, I guess my thing was just really kind of like, Okay, well, this also happens in sports, and this also happens. It does, in this. but no, it, but, that's but not... it wasn't me dismissing anyone's kind of critique of it. It was just more like, let's step back and say, this is a cultural problem. It's not it's a, a pro it's not obviously a... it's a huge cultural problem. Yeah, but, but I, I think in I our know. roles as critics, who are published, who are asked to to comment on these these incidents, we have to be very concise, very clear, and 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 be talking about that moment. I think. 
No, no, I'm, I'm totally with that. But it, there was also like, so there's her making it. There's it being the called, response to it. Yeah, the response yep, yep, yep. to it. And yeah. so, but I don't know if you like. At least I feel like me myself as a critic, it's like I'm looking at all of that stuff. And so when you say destroy a painting, you know, like, right, of course, you know, all of that stuff. And, and maybe that is a, you know, like maybe that is a viable. Thing that should happen, right? Like that's not a strategy we've taken, you know, against art in this country before. Perhaps that's, you know, but but it was like it was about the questioning, and I and I just felt like that with in that particular instance, there was so many things at least made me feel uncomfortable about that conversation, where I'm just like, so are we? Is it just because she's white? Like it's that is that yes. the problem? And so I'm just like, okay, well, yes, you is. know, and for me, I don't know. I just felt like it went. It, the situation and the painting went beyond like the fact that she was just white. It was about the way that black images are commodified in this country and the way that like some commodified black artists by have who? Yeah, I mean but by us and them. Like this is not like this is not just a one sided thing. And so like I you know, and I think that like that is the problem here. Like the problem is like we look at images of black people and we say like, oh, we probably also had a role in that. Not saying that like it was all our role or whatever, but it's like we are also selling our own images, and so like, and so I'm kind of more interested in like that thing. Mm -hmm. When we, you know, like like who then, be, you know, it's the Zadie Smith thing, you know, who owns Black Pain, you know? Oh, is let's it, not go there. You know, let's not, like, let's you know, not, it's not, like, no, 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 no can, but I mean, can, it, but can. that is a, I mean, not the piece, but it was the question in itself <laughs> was really interesting, given the dynamics of this country, and so I think like I was kind of more interested in the whole conversation and not just saying like you know this you know whatever this this painting is wrong we knew well, that I on need the you face to of it. write a whole like book yeah it because <laughs> i love what you're okay we're gonna open it up sorry to questions right here in the front um so i guess uh, going off of the initial conversation which sorry. um you know as a person who works in art and who knows this i'm sort of tired of the focus and centering yes. the conversation around her and not really talking about the rest of the artists in the Whitney Biennial. But mm -hmm. one question I have to sort of move it a little bit uh, away from center on whiteness, but in looking at the choices that people of color make within different communities of color and sort of solidarity or lack of solidarity, because both of the curators of the Whitney Biennial were people of color. And so where within their choices, where is the criticism in how um, they may have chosen to portray and choose work by a white artist to portray a black body? But that so was... my question is how do we navigate that and how do we sort of build inter people of color solidarity? I mean, like in a word, they were wrong too, but they all, but you know, like, I mean, like, and that but also that's that's the conversation around like you know poc solidarity right and like and that blackness in this country is a different type of thing and like and like and i you know i have not located you know <laughs> the difference but like it is a different thing and so like the cliches around like you know like they're you know asian americans and you know they are people of color and they understand that's not that it, they don't yeah like that's just not the case right and so and so, you know, that, I don't know, like, that was kind of interesting. But also, you know, and then when the Whitney convened their, I'm going to get in trouble, but like, you know, like when the, the Whitney convened their, you know, their, their talk by Claudia Rankin. Did you and go she, to that? I went and she yeah. got up there and she, you know, did this like kumbaya moment. And you're just like, really, though? <laughs> like, like, this is what you're going to, like, like, you wrote Citizen. Is this really, you know, so like, I, you know, and then the part that they, if you weren't there, the part they cut out is Lau Ashton Harris getting up and like going ham. You know, like, and and so, like, not to focus this on her because obviously there's, you know, lots to be saying, but like, it's like people are making choices every day, black, <laughs> white, people and everyone in between. Choices. And like, and so just to say that, like, this simply hangs at Dana Schultz, you know, footsteps, it is a mischaracterization, a mischaracterization of art in this country and like the choices that people are making around art. And I don't think that was the conversation that we're having in this country. Okay, we've got one over here, two over here, two in the back. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I love it. Sorry, it's loud. I love it. 
Yeah, so I, um, I was curious to know, because all of you write for publications that have, I'm assuming, majority white audiences. And so how does that affect when you're critiquing a work of art that's by a person of color? Do you, do you grapple with you know, being super honest in your critique occasionally or feeling like you have to because you know that the audience is going to be white and, you know, they're already struggling and they already really tried to make it. Sort of what you were saying, Alex, earlier about Aziz sorry and, like, not being a great actor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, he, you know, he has this show and he's hiring all these writers. And so how do you sort of balance that? I guess briefly, I have a list of publications who write things that, like, I absolutely cannot stand and I would never work for them because... <laughs> of those things that they wrote. And like that's a choice and that's you know like you know whatever like you have to make money and all that stuff but it's just like there's a list of places where I'm like you are in fact not helping the cause and you think you are and mm. so you will not have my words. I don't care what you offer me. And that's just like my personal kind of choice and like the other things like I don't do that like I just don't have that like I'm not trying to make white people feel comfortable, you yeah, know. I and so more, I meant more like sort of what you're talking you said earlier So sort of looking at that idea of like, if someone, if a person of color who, you know, someone like Issa Rae, who has all this pressure on her, and she's making a TV show, and if, and if you personally don't like it, mm -hmm. but you're a, a critic for Vulture, do you... <laughs> That's really do interesting. You, do, uh, one, yeah. do you say like, oh, maybe I shouldn't write this here because this is in the right space because the people that are going to be reading this, you know, maybe I keep it to the group text. So <laughs> I... <I'm just> like, <laughs> So I, I review books for the LA Times and I, and I do occasionally write um, criticism for um, television and film and whatnot. And um, editors always say to me, uh, are you able to write about this critically? Um, and, and I wouldn't do really? it if I could. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I also am really old, and I've known a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> like, I've been in the industry for a long oh, time. Oh, you mean, okay, like you just so know people. Like, like okay, I know okay. folks. So, okay. so, you know, when someone asks me to review Roxane Gay, it's like, do you, you know her, but can you write about this objectively yeah. okay. or what, whatever? And Isa, who I've known forever. And, but yes, to, I, I, I think that ultimately the criticism is for them with love. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, I will always forever think about that in, you know, the vein, criticism, cultural criticism is not about attacking art or, or, or people or genres. It's about looking at something um, in a way that you are dedicated to it. You're spending your time with that. Um, and so it really ultimately, I think, comes from a place of respect and admiration. But do you think that, at least like with criticism, at least is one of the things that's always going through my mind, is that criticism, like a lot of things, is basically a white kind of like, you know, like institution, right? And so sometimes- oh, no, no, we just established why we're here tonight, okay. And so, <laughs> so sometimes what's not needed, at least for me, is not criticism. What's mean, needed for me is, you know, going back to the trailer thing, is these are the ideas. I'm just putting the ideas out there. I and, love and it. Sometimes Absolutely. That, and that sometimes should be what criticism is, is though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but yeah. like more in like a, like a reporting role. Like I am describing what is happening here. And like sometimes people go to well, task. It's go to task for, but I mean. you're also attaching yourself to it in some way. Right. Right? Or I like, mean, okay, so like for example, when I write, a, you know, when I like do these like long conversations in an interview magazine, right, with different artists, right? One of the artists, um, people didn't like the work, right? And then I'm kind of reading a com I never co like comment on them, but I'm always reading the comments and it's like, don't you, the never, like, don't do you it, didn't don't do it, go, you know, like, never. why didn't you like challenge him on, you know, X, Y, and Z? And I'm just like, mm. well, that's not my role in this particular, in you know what I mean? Like well, there, there's course, a it's different- also that commenter's fantasy. Yeah, right, that too. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna add, okay. Uh, cool. <laughs> um, well, I, I once wrote a piece about Mindy Kaling, because I think Mindy Kaling's like hella problematic. And um, I don't have any allegiance to you because you're brown. I think that's kind of ridiculous. I think that like, especially because there's so much anti-blackness in like South Asian communities, I think it's like super important to be like, hey, um, maybe you're not doing something right. And, and like, Min you were talking about white supremacy being uh, what did you say? Flexible. flexible. And I think that that's when it's flexible, right? Yeah. Like when like um, black
black and brown folks buy into it. And like Mindy Kaling has a TV mm-hmm. show that largely just has white people yep. and is for a white audience. And I think it's important to call those things out because um, if I don't do it, nobody else will. Or maybe nobody else will feel comfortable doing it. And I think especially where we are right now, you know, you brought up how do you how do we like create togetherness within people of color communities? I think it's like holding ourselves accountable when we do things that are bad you know like when you know and it's okay to be like you're anti-black and then like just like talk about it but if we're not talking about it uh like you know these brown tastemakers are going to continue writing white supremacy like shit for white percent white white supremacy (laughs) and i think that that's unfortunate so i i think it's i think it's really important to call people out i don't Oh. You don't think the art itself is good? Do you feel oh. Ah, uh, yeah, that's tough. That's tricky. Um, you know, like I can, I can count on my like one hand how many brown folks have anything. You know, like there's like no, you know, there's really not a lot for us. So I, I definitely like. I mean, I can say Aziz Ansari is a bad actor, and that's true. And like, I get off on that, but. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I would like write a piece about him being a bad actor. You know, like I, I would openly say it like on Twitter, but I don't I don't think he needs that and I don't need to say that. You know? Let's take one more question in the back here in the back. Yeah. Waving your hand in the air <laughs> like you just don't care. Thank you. Um, this question's kind of for Alex, but it can <laughs> <laughs> it can um, fan out. Um, so Alex, I was really interested in what you said about deconstructing whiteness in an unintentional way in girls. Uh Um, (laughs) And I was thinking about the fact that there's so much of at least American pop cultural production that inherently has whiteness. And then I was connecting it back to the question about picking and choosing at what point you call it out. So I'm wondering about that spectrum because conceivably one could say, when I look at girls, I'm just going to pretend, I'm just gonna like put myself in the world, keep that criticism aside and just talk about formalism or how was this plot constructed, all of these kinds of things. And I'm wondering, since one could make an argument around white supremacy about virtually almost anything that mm-hmm. we watch in American cultural production, what is that spectrum? Oh. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all right. We'll hold your hair back then. <laughs> How do you decide at what point you, you kind of suspend your disbelief in, in a white criticism and look towards something else? Or how do you negotiate um, whether or not you're looking at a work of art and you're making that critique at the same time as you're looking at all of these other things? How are they bound up as one and really inextricable um, between the two or three or four? Um, so what is that negotiation as critics? Right. I, th- I, th- I think for me, the it's always there because the white supremacy or the logic or the language is embedded in the formalism too. So like when you're talking about girls and world building and narrative and characters and all of that, all of that formal language is still uh, sort of sec- secured by whiteness in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so for me, there's a little bit of a difference between, for instance, watching that and maybe like why I watch The Bold Type or like Gossip Girl or like these uh, other shows that I think are also kind of um, about they're also participating in the same kind of language about whiteness. They're a little more escapist or fluffy in certain ways, which we can get into gender stuff about. But um, but when I when I watch those, I'm still aware of the way in which that language is operating. Uh, I guess like my own comfort or discomfort with it will modulate or change depending on what I'm watching. And I guess for me as a writer or critic, it's about it's about deciding whether or not this is something new or interesting to write about. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it is, then I will. Um, and I'll take someone to task, even uh, like Mindy Kaling, for instance. Mm-hmm. Or if it's something that like, you know, like sometimes I think you have to ask yourself, is this just a tweet? 
Because if it is, <laughs> sure. just tweet it. Yeah, and yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to write a whole like 800 word take about it. You don't. Just tweet it. Yeah. It's fine. Hey, hey, I'm going to close it there. You all, my beautiful, smart, brilliant guests. Thank you, Antoine, Faria, and Alex, and all of y'all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.